Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. I know we are all from very different regions. Thank you for uh, coming along and uh, listening to us talk about collective innovation. Uh, we have, I, uh, in this panel, three extremely distinguished uh, researchers. Uh, we have Chris Wagner, who's going to talk about resolving mysteries of collective innovation. We have Hila, who's going to talk about how to accelerate collective innovation without killing it. And then finally, we have Oliver Alexi who, with us, who's going to talk about creating innovation ecosystems for deep tech. Uh, so I look forward to hearing my three colleagues. Uh, I'll start us out very briefly, uh, setting up uh, the theme for the day. And you'll see we're diverse in our thought, but uh, there is definitely convergence in uh, how we're thinking about collective innovation. So I'm going to start us out by talking a little bit about uh, a decade of research that I have conducted with Anne Marjek. Uh, who's not with us today, but I am representing her. Uh, so I'll talk about how do you unleash collective intelligence through a collective production process. Uh, uh, and this will be placed in the context of uh, crowdsourcing, which is popular terminology or, and one mechanism for collective intelligence. Uh, it's everywhere, I don't have to convince you. We've seen over a decade of these from, uh, from one end of the earth to the other. Uh, so it's not just a, a Western concept, Asian concept, but it's everywhere. Everybody wants to uh, use collective intelligence and by using crowdsourcing. Uh, when we started this research a decade ago, uh, this is what we heard in our initial interviews. Uh, most of the ideas we get are the ones we've already thought of. And then MIT Technology Review had this whole thing about collective intelligence kind of reduces back to small groups. It's the most effective. And then a few see, uh, the chief innovation officer said, we are so disappointed with crowdsourcing, we now think it's just brand building. So this was our start and we started to think what could perhaps be uh, some of the things that are going wrong with the crowdsourcing as a form of collective innovation. Uh, so I, I'm not gonna belabor through this, but I think a couple of things uh, to highlight, three of them. Uh, first is that problems always as a given that a company as a sponsor of a contest or crowdsourcing challenge defines a problem in which everybody has to solve. That could be potentially something that's uh, ailing collective innovation uh, leveraging. Um, the second is that individuals already have an idea and they bring it to the table and they just have to tell it to the company and the company can go ahead and uh, implement it and everything will be great, it'll be innov innovative. Uh, so that could potentially be an issue that's ailing uh, how you leverage collective innovation. It's not really collective innovation, it's collection of innovation rather than collective innovation. And then finally, collective innovation means everybody working together. Uh, the process of collaboration is predefined and it can be laid out just like it would be laid out inside a company for innovation teams or R&D functions. So those are the things we started to think of think of those as hypotheses. Uh, and through perhaps over a decade, we ran a bunch of uh, crowdsourcing contests, innovation contests. We studied over another 50 of them, which companies were already processing to see whether uh, they're following what we think is a process that should be followed for collective innovation. Uh, so what we call collective production process. So the end point of the story is that we think there is a collective production process that is better than what's generally being leveraged by companies. Uh, and so the first one, which we think is a problem, is that instead of problem being predefined, if truly collective intelligence has to be leveraged, then the crowd or the collective has to define and solve the problem simultaneously. Uh, so the problem cannot be a given problem in itself uh, is just a starting point. And if that's the starting point, as the collective or the crowd solves the problem, it also redefines the problem. And so the problem is not a fix, but truly innovation occurs when the problem is being simultaneously defined as the solutions are being searched for. Uh, the second one is that the bar of ideas that give us your best ideas, and that's enough, individual ideas is not is a very high bar A. Most people may not have ideas, but they might have a lot to say about the problem itself in defining the problem. So uh, in a collective production process, uh, 
crowd or the collective shares a variety of knowledge. Uh, and it's just not ideas. So what, what, what are a variety of ideas? And I think we're just start, starting at this kind of defining. So it could be facts about the problem. It could be examples about how the problem may have been solved in the similar domain or a different domain. It could be idea seeds rather than a com comprehensive solution. Uh, it could be integrated solutions. Somebody combines these, some from outside, some from inside the collective, and you have integrated solutions. And most of all, there are trade-offs. So you're looking at all aspects of the problem while you solve it. So that could be one. The other is if collective has to be brought together, they're not gonna engage in the conventional, highly interactive synchronous uh, means of collaboration. It's, it's almost a short burst of engagements as and when any given individual in the collective has time, she or he can contribute any form of a knowledge, not just ideas. So that could be one. Uh, so if you look at all the data we had, most of them, about 75% participate only at one time in the collective, any individual, and only 5% participate throughout the process if, if it's a definite uh, time-oriented process. So that could be one. I mean, if that is the case that everybody's participating in slivers of time, how does collective innovation happen? And it's almost passing knowledge batons. So it's, it's not synchronous, it's highly asynchronous. It's highly dependent on when any individual in the collective may have time or knowledge to contribute. And what they do is they contribute whatever form. It is not just ideas, again, it could be examples, trade-offs, facts that are related to the problem or the redefinition of a problem. And so what they're passing on is this asynchronous batons. Uh, it's almost of a re relay in form of knowledge passing. Uh, there's two forms that we started studying, uh, which I think could now be extended to many other forms, which, which are examples, which is analogies, which we've already studied in literature quite often. And the other is trade-offs, which are parallel axis or conflicting requirements. Uh, these we found are very instrumental in formulating the problem or reformulating the problem, but also uh, moving towards more integrative solutions. Uh, the challenge is that over time, they dissipate, they evaporate quite rapidly in the sense uh, the collective is focused on very recent knowledge. And if, uh, if these examples and trade-offs occurred somewhere very early in the process, they might have lost their impact by now or, uh, or the knowledge has grown so fast that these might be lost over time. So in a collective production process, it becomes pretty imperative to not just propagate ideas, it's not a brainstorming process, but rather propagating creativity triggers in forms of examples and trade-offs over time so that they continue to spark uh, thinking of the problem as well as thinking of integrative solutions. The other aspect is that instead of just ideas, what we found was that expressing needs is equally important, if not more. And the needs could be a need encountered in a different context or just an abstract or a concrete need. Uh, so what that does is it extends the initial idea or leads to proposal of new ideas in terms of process. What is key is that decoupling the ideas from the needs and, and focusing on, uh, on modifying the needs themselves. And then that is almost a form of redefining the problem. And then the other is that instead of being uh, predefined roles uh, in, in terms of this process, people can play up to six roles and they, they could be more, but you know, it could be ideators, which are tend to be the gravitational pull. They could be fact sharers. They could be clarifiers by asking questions. They could be cross idea pollinators, or they could be just contributing creativity stimulators in terms of examples and trade-offs. But they tend to pick their own roles as the process rolls along. So to summarize all of this together, it's one is it's short time commitment through knowledge baton passing. No individual in a collective needs to be there synchronously in a highly interactive way. Uh, they share a variety of knowledge, not just ideas. They tend to focus on amplifying creativity triggers, uh, examples, trade-offs. Uh, they tend to engage in expansive thinking, which considering ideas and needs together, and then trying to breaking apart the needs to extend the needs or modify the needs in many ways, redefining the problem, and then picking their own roles to play. And th those are all around knowledge baton passing or clarifying the problem or reformulating the problem. That's what I have. And uh, 
in interest of time, I think what we'll do is if you want to put your questions in chat, we can all go through our short presentations, 10 to 12 minutes, and then try to answer in a true form of collective intelligence, try to answer this at the end. So with that, I am going to uh, stop and invite Chris to share his thoughts on resolving the mysteries of collective innovation. Thank you. Uh, fascinating. You've left us hungry and intrigued. So, uh, Chris, uh, refer to NASA and in terms of NASA and collective intelligence, who better to invite now than Gila, who's uh, been looking not just at NASA, but very fascinating things from hackathons to a lot of collective intelligence mechanisms. So without further ado, Gila, please welcome. I think you're on mute, Taylor. You, I am the number one sentence, right? In conferences, I think you're on mute. So any, everyone can see my slides? Wonderful. Okay, so thank you so much for the introduction. And indeed, what an energizing talk, uh, Chris, uh, a lot of interesting ideas. I am going to go deep into one topic in my talk today that I think has been very relevant this year, and it is time, the time that it takes to innovate. So I'm going to talk about how can we accelerate collective innovation without killing it. And this is based on a paper that, I don't know, I was told by MJ it should be published in June. Today is June 30, so probably today or tomorrow, hopefully it should appear, but it's still in press. So if you're interested, uh, you can read more about it. I will be uh, brief a little bit today. So we know that one way to get collectives in person and also now online to innovate has been hackathons and crowd-based hackathons and accelerating technology. Ben, you have your hand raised? Yes, do you wanna go into presentation mode? We're seeing the uh, slide editor. How come? I am on presentation mode. Is it better now? Uh, might be which window you're sharing. It might be that you're sharing, ah. you just shared one window and it was the slide editor. How about this one now? Uh, switch back. That's much better. Oh, thank you. Okay. So hackathons, how many people here have participated in a hackathon? I don't know, or, or, or organized one? Not enough. Okay. So, okay. I see more hands. Great. Arvind. Okay. Definitely. Okay, more people, indeed. Oh, now I see all the raised hands, definitely. So I think hackathons are a fabulous ways. Oh, more and more hands, that's great. So for all of you that have participated, organized hackathons, I think they are a great opportunity for us to study as collective intelligence researchers and they're underexplored. Jawad, I see more hands, that's awesome. I think it is a great way to bring people together. Some of you talked, I think, Arvind, about these like bursts of energy in collective intelligence. These are rapid uh, events, and then to assume that people uh, will then disperse. So it's ad hoc and accelerated innovation. So these are the two conditions that I'm focusing on. The accelerated part, something that usually takes much longer. How can it happen faster? So a lot of accelerating technologies today our claim to make work and rapid prototyping much faster. We have 3D printing, laser printers that are faster than before, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, all type of uh, technologies that are claimed to make, you know, the same R&D processes that used to, take, used to take months or weeks into days. Another trend that of course we've all experienced this year is sometimes reality requires acceleration. The vaccine, first time in history to have a vaccine in less than a year, right? Uh, to a pandemic. Um, accelerating on medical device. I have another study looking into ventilators, how fast people were able to invent new medical device that are highly regulated and highly risky in a couple of months, uh, processes that usually take three to five years. So we are seeing more of this accelerated ad hoc innovation that is done in a collective way. Um, but what does it actually mean? Is it just the same thing faster? Or what happens when you take an innovation journey as Van de Van and others were talking about in their book that usually takes months and weeks and has a trajectory and all of a sudden take it and make it into a sprint? What would we predict by the literature and what do I see for my work? So the literature would predict the time pressure will kill it. And that's why my title is kind of how can we accelerate without killing it? So time pressure has been known cognitively 
to impede the ability to think creatively, creatively and outside of the box, right? We have all experienced it, I'm sure, in our lives when we are under the gun. It's very hard then to think creatively and do problem solving. The second problem is the fact that you have ad hoc collectives, teams coming to work together. These people have never met each other. We know coordination is very hard. So when you put ad hoc teams on innovative tasks, it's even harder because it's not clear what are they trying to develop. The solution to the problem is not known. As Arvin talked, the problem, the solution are being kind of co-evolved usually. And how are we going to work as a team? Most times, the process is not written and not given. People don't know each other. They don't know who should do what, no clear leadership. And that's actually the ethos that hackathons want to preserve. They don't want to assign hierarchy and roles and leadership. So how can we do this ad hoc innovation? So by the literature, it would fail. But in reality, we see many new products and services that get created this way through hackathons. So how come? That was the puzzle I was uh, excited to study. And we conducted a field study in assistive technology hackathons for a couple of years. So initially, I did a one year of exploratory study of hackathons, makeathons, all kinds. But then I did a more focused study on 13 projects in health tech accelerated innovation processes that have very clear and comparable outcomes because I wanted to compare apples and apples. So all of the projects that I'm talking to you about today started with the same starting point. They had similar conditions across all the projects, the same technology that was able for them all in big maker spaces that collective came together, individuals volunteered for 72 hours similar challenges of assistive technology, real problems of real individuals that need those uh, technologies that companies are not producing today, ad hoc time frame, they all disperse afterwards, and uh, extremely limited time frame for the challenge that is given. I collaborated with Tom Global, an assistive technology uh, organization that runs Hackathon, and by the way, is inviting always professors and students to do it. So if you are interested in bringing it to your university or any organization, uh, contact them, Google Org, uh, which is the kind of non-for-profit part of Google and different makers uh, spaces. So what did we find in brief? Uh, we found that this accelerated and ad hoc time for does not only create time pressure as we know it from the literature, but it also creates temporal ambiguity, which means what do I do even first, right? You have this really extremely short period of time and the quotes would uh, express it even better than what I can. So the sense I got from everybody in the room was, what are we even doing? Uh, we've got a team that just met each other and you have to figure out all these groups dynamics and you're given a challenge that you're expected to start working on and make a solution right away. So we have 72 hours, new people, a new challenge. What do you even do first? There is this sense of ambiguity. How do people cope with ambiguity? So we saw two patterns, two types of groups. Several teams basically dealt with ambiguity by importing and compressing temporal structures, best innovation practices that they knew, agile, um, kind of a lot of brainstorming methods that they knew, and tried to make it faster. And I brought this cool image that I saw actually this year used again and again around innovation and acceleration, that we should just take our schedule and compress it. This is what these teams try to do, what they used to do in weeks, they would do in hours. So I have quotes here, people saying, okay, agile methods we meet or scrum we do once a day, stand up meeting, we'll do it every three hours instead. Uh, that also meant that they try to do full and clear coordination according to the best practices of coordination. People just met each other, they should introduce each other, create a common goal, a common clear solution that they're about to develop. So we looked into their designs and exactly looked at how clear was the, the goal that they had, how clear was the solution that they were trying to uh, propose for the team and to agree about. They had clear mechanism, clear measures. You can see even in the sketches how they tried to get to an agreement about the specific materials and measures that they will be using. And then they talked about, we're going to divide and conquer and did a very clear division of labor. So kind of by the book, great teamwork. So it looked great. Unfortunately, I'm gonna kind of jump ahead 72 hours and tell you that all of these teams failed. So they look great, they worked really great as a team, but these conditions of accelerated ad hoc innovation requires something different from these best practices that we've been teaching and that they, they brought from their organizations. 
So what are those teams that were able uh, to do it somehow and create new working products in 72 hours? What they did, we conceptualize as minimal and adaptive coordination. So they did not try to fully coordinate. They almost did the opposite. Instead, they just started in, in one hour or even less to talk about overall direction. You can see the difference even in the sketches, right? You can see that they have a small post-it note. What we need is something that connects to a device that can press three different buttons via remote control. This is very different from that accurate measurements that the other team that I showed you, right? So in another team that they have this interesting prosthetic arm, they basically wrote X's uh, instead of trying to really calculate the measurements and really quickly jumped and split without clear division of labor, without a clear plan, no clear materials or measurements of how they're about to build their device, but started to do a lot of hyper experimentation very fast. So only minimal level of agreement, that's the beginning. So I, we define it as start only with a high level solution, rough idea, not fully detailed or with specific measurements, methods or material, and then quickly jump to uh, working separately. They said, we need to solve this problem, but how we get from here to there, it's pretty open. And the adaptive part actually came gradually and later throughout those hours, they frequently and swiftly sense what the other team member is doing. Because the fact that they split sounds maybe magical, but it meant that it was very messy. A lot of redundancies. They did not coordinate, right? They literally did not know what the other person is doing. So many times in one of the teams that I was a part of, one person developed something with three buttons, the other one with two. You know, it took them a couple of hours even to notice. So they ran so fast to work, but they did not work in a coordinated way. So what did enable in the end to build an integrated uh, product was the fact that they swiftly adaptive to each other. They started checking, what are you doing? And they quickly adjusted their kind of trajectory when they saw that the other person was not aligned, but did not try to fully convince, have long discussions the, like the other teams did and every time convince the whole team and said, let's agree on what we're doing. The advantage was that they were not attached to any specific design. So this enabled them to move so quickly and change something like 11 designs in one of the teams in these 72 hours. So they talked about themselves that they are aware in the end of it that their coordination was poor. If I had to rate our communication, I would say negative four, right? They realized they were not communicating well. We were not a well-oiled machine, but we did what we needed to do and created a product. Um, so this is kind of from the paper a little bit more if you're curious about what it means to do full, full coordination versus adaptive and minimal and both. And I just want to say that from kind of an emotional perspective, when you're in such teams or when you're watching them, it feels very messy, this minimal and adaptive. So don't get scared in that sense by it, because the well-organized one started very organized, but in the end confronted the mess and the failure. This started kind of with this foggy feeling of what exactly are we doing, who's doing what, but slowly like there, the clarity emerged through this adaptive sensing and uh, swiftly adapting to each other. So if you have any questions, I'm here to answer about anything related to accelerating collective uh, intelligence. Thank you, Hila. That was super fascinating and you continue to bring temporal elements to uh, collective intelligence. We appreciate that. Uh, I would highly recommend reading the paper. It should be in press by now. <laughs> uh, so Thanks. We'll move on to Oliver, take it a level higher, who will talk a little bit about creating innovation ecosystems to deploy deep tech. Uh, he will tell us what deep tech is along the way too. So Oliver, welcome. Um, Arvind, everyone, thank you very much for having me. Um, as Arvind said, my name is Oliver Alexi. I come from um, as a school of uh, technology at the um, Technical University of Munich here in Germany. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship. My first training is in IS, but sort of most of the work that I do is about um, organization theory and then questions around sort of uncertainty um, and where sort of deep tech and open innovation um, and then ecosystems and all these sort of um, um, topics naturally collide. And before I start, I just want to uh, point out that um, the work that I'm going to present is not is not my own. There's quite a few co-authors and colleagues behind this, or Kahatu Bristate, Terry Griffith, uh, and Maishok Arvind, actually, uh, just as well, uh, and uh, David Reitz, a um, um, PhD student um, of mine, who was on the market, if anyone is interested. Um, and of course, there's um, 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 a great amount of um, um, colleagues in management, such as um, Kathy Eisenhower, Carlos Baldwin, Ron Adler, 
and many others that I'm building on. And on the coordination side, actually, I've seen uh, that, that uh, Tom Malone and Kevin Krausen were in the room. Um, so some of the sort of original inspiration, of course, is, is there as well. What am I talking about when I talk about deep tech? Well, first of all, of course, it's a huge opportunity because the word's thrown around all the time when you uh, listen to investors. Um, um, quite simply, what I'm talking about is um, um, a, a technological invention relatively deep in the technology stack. So if you think about the ISO OSI model, yeah, you look at the bottom, that means if something changes there, quite a lot on the top should change as well. Uh, what makes it interesting is that bottom thing can be applied sort of um, in a, a wide variety of applications, industries, and so on. Yeah, so that means you don't just have a lot of going on within one tech stack, you have a potential unlimited amount of tech stacks that you can place next to each other. And there, of course, then we can speak about generativity, you know, that, that we just don't know what potentially could happen, uh, what some sort of earth shattering, groundbreaking technology could cause. Yes, and of course, the first examples that will come to mind originally is the internet, but you can think of AI, you can think of RMA, you can think of CRISPR. Uh, there's so many things you can put on top but there's so many areas in which you can use it. It's really, really hard to predict what's going on. And it's not just those things. You can even think of um, things like magnetic levitation, the hyperloop. You can think of um, um, transportation challenges yes, such as vertical takeoff and industries that would emerge around those, yeah? the hyperloop transportation and systems, um, um, air taxis. And you see how the challenge there is not necessarily how to deploy the technology. We can figure that out along the way. Um, the challenge is, if I invest today into a Hyperloop, if I invest today into um, uh, take a, into um, um, air taxis, how do I design the business model in five years? And how do I do invention today that I'm inventing for the right business model? Um, so deep tech, um, from the perspective of somebody who tries to make a coordinated entry there, um, is a catch-22. Why is it a catch-22? Well, it takes up to 10 years, and I can give you an example where it's 30 years or more um, of a development time until actually an application crystallizes yeah and with hindsight 2020 you could say we could have gotten there much faster but you will only know by sort of investing continuously into development but at the point in time that you make the investment into continuous development there's no way you predict the killer app yeah so you can think of the henry ford faster horses example you can think of a ton of things yeah? but the, the the likelihood that you predict the killer app with some sort of i mean you can think of the arm and a example and the lady at, 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 at wharton that was was supposed to be let go when she made the invention. There's for pretty much any technology, this kind of example. Yeah? Finding the killer app means needs more development. The problem is that development is costly and path dependent. Yeah? So that means if I don't get it right in the beginning, I might actually run out of resources on the way there. Yeah? And then that figuring out that catch 22 um, is, is well, if you figure it out, you're a star. Um, if you don't figure it out, well, good luck on the way. Um, you can link this to dominant designs, first mover advantages, um, whatever you want. Yeah, so quite simply, uh, that means that for the organization here is, um, it's impossible to plan the ecosystem. Yeah, And as I said before, the problem isn't necessarily on the tech side. Yes, tech standards would help. The problem is, and, and Chris was actually alluding to this before, the problem is unknown preferences. Yeah, I don't know, even if I would figure out technology today, the customer has never seen this before, how would I do this? It's, it's just completely unknown. And so the, one of the pictures that I showed you before, this Lilium, they, they just made a fantastic entry actually on the Nasdaq, so some of you may have heard of this company. They don't know what kind of air taxi or air travel even they should build. Yeah, should they connect cities? Should they connect regions? Should they build a small jet? Should they build a large jet? Should they rent it out? Should they white label? All of these things, however, may be somehow connected to technological investments they need now. They would need a smaller jet, a larger jet. They would need point-to-point uh, -point, um, um, hubs, whatever else. They would need to invest in, in different kinds of licenses. It's really, really tough to predict. If we take a step back from this, that means that quite a lot of the approaches that we um, um, research and teach about how I don't know, entrepreneurs will combat uncertainty, such as micro experiments, become increasingly difficult. Yeah? The first is a question of if resources are limited and I don't really know what I'm after, what experiment should I actually be running? And second, how should I judge the result? Yeah? How would I know that this result is accurate or a false positive or a false negative? Yeah? Given I don't know where I'm going for sure, it's really, really hard to tell in advance. Organizations actually know this. So as a side note, um, um, any organizations that we've ever spoken to, um, at least um, some of this data is 10 years old, they hate the idea of ecosystems from the bottom of their heart. They would rather go it alone. Uh, ecosystem means additional coordination challenge, it means seizing control, it means sharing profits. So if they could, they would always want to go it alone. 
Uh, they can't. They understand that. They understand precisely the catch-22, that they will run out of resources before they get there. Where the collective intelligence angle becomes in entirely interesting is if the problem is actually this, this shortness of resources, yeah, that if we ran micro experiments, we'll never find it because we, can, we cannot run enough. Well, if I could run an unlimited number, if I, if I get people yeah, to, to run these experiments for me, in essence, I get other people, it's a literal quote from one of the organizations that we spoke to, if I get other people and other organizations to do their job, if they find the killer app for me, now that seems to be a very promising lead. And I'll give two examples in, in just a moment. Uh, but what that means from, what it means conceptually, and this is also the original struggle that many of the organizations that we spoke to here had, is that you need to think not about an ecosystem as you're deploying a product, but it means you are deploying a process. Uh, it means you have um, almost like in a, in a thermodynamic model where you sort of uh, you pull levers and you sort of you control the temperature and so on and so forth. You need to be continuously managing a set of activities around sort of a general idea that you have rather than developing towards a set and specific goal. Two examples in which I can illustrate this a little uh, more cleanly. One is um, Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, one of the multiple organizations that is trying to deploy a Hyperloop. They got fantastic activities around the Great Lake. They got fantastic um, activities in, in Abu Dhabi. And what's super interesting about this, this is not your Hyperloop One heavy investment, Richard Branson sort of organization. This is a largely volunteer-based organization. Now, specifically, we're talking about 50 people that are forming a hardcore of this organization, about 300 um, members, that sort of go in and out. Yeah, the core can decide who's currently also a part. And there's 40,000 people who've submitted a resume who would really part of this, of this, would really want to be a part of this item. And what they can do with this amount of folks is they can run parallel experiments, developments, business opportunities, core technologies, what you want. And they are truly in parallel. That means they're partly redundant. Uh, because they don't know which of these applications is the right one. And what they're trying to do is basically create a pool of knowledge that can be reassembled when the time is right. Yeah, so if actually a business opportunity came by, they can go back to this pool of knowledge and think, okay, what can we do with this? Now, can we deploy this specific Hyperloop? Yeah, so their goal is not to deploy the Hyperloop. Yeah, the goal is to have a set of knowledge that would allow you to sort of reconfigure all the options that are around to build a contextually specified solution uh, and, and potentially further, including further development. When I look at uh, incumbents, um, I, can, I can mention IBM because it's Henry Chesper's work that I'm drawing on here. Some of my own work, you see the reference here calls two fantastic organizations, red and green. So you can learn more about red and green uh, in the paper here after um, um, having realized that they need to go for an ecosystem, what those organizations would initially try is sort of keep a broad vision. And if you think back, if you think back about the early days of Watson, this is even pre-Jeopardy, yeah, you, you hear all these great stories about what this technology could do and how in, what incredible amount of applications um, um, it would have. Um, what red and green would do, what IBM didn't in the case of Watson, is they showed then others how they could interact with the technology. So Henry Chesper's argument is one of the reasons that Watson didn't take off, and I firmly buy into this argument, is they didn't do, um, for example, APIs, which they do in quite a lot of their other technologies, and they very early locked in on healthcare as a key application. And it turns out healthcare didn't take off. Uh, while if you would establish a continuous process in which you actually let other people come up with applications for your, key, um, for your key technology, sometimes steer them a little, um, say through conferences, or if you think about open source, Alinus Torvalds regularly points out, over oh, there is a cool area, I wouldn't a couple of volunteers further develop here, then aggregate that information uh, and, and continuously update, okay, is my vision still accurate? Uh, and is my vision uh, crystallized to a degree that I can strike? Uh, that has allowed these organizations to be fantastically successful. Yeah, in essence, they waited for the killer app to emerge uh, from people that developed around their platforms. Um, and uh, if you think about other platforms that have been usually successful, that is usually the story. Yeah? And, um, if you think back about the original presentation of the iPhone, there's a wonderful quote from Steve Jobs is, the killer app is making calls. Uh, and within a couple of weeks, the phone is hacked, and it turns out he was wrong, um, even on what the killer app would be. And that is at a point in time when they have the iPod and selling music, iTunes, on that same platform. 
what does it mean? A couple of um, um, suggestions, speculations, and whatever else that, that um, could potentially be, be interesting, useful basis for discussion. On a people perspective, um, we see this means um, um, that these sort of um, um, open platforms are driven by um, people that are good at process. Your standard argument about a T-shaped person, for example, in this Hyperloop setting that I mentioned before, the, um, the person that's running the group on um, um, propulsion, of course, they don't have propulsion, they use magnetic levitation, but actually he's a rocket engineer who knows a lot about propulsion. And so that person understands things about uh, getting th things up to speed to move high G forces and so on and so forth, uh, but, but has no idea actually about, about magnetic levitation at its, at its very core. With respect to standard questions of organizational strategy yeah, of, of um, power of IP and so on and so forth. What we see is this, this idea of predicting where the market would go and then and erecting fences and, and IP barriers and standards and whatever else it could still apply, but most of the time it will, it will help you build a beautiful dam, fortress in the desert where nobody's ever going to go because the market could move fundamentally different. And um, there's a very interesting emerging work in the field of strategy that, that thinks of this as a sort of shaping or framing and all these sort of questions yeah, that, that you're directing these processes even without uh, even outside your organization. Um, there's a question about a trade-off or, uh, or a substitutive relationship or a complementary relationship between size and speed. Now, ideally, you'd be fast and mobile. And we see in this context that, that small firms, they're actually really good at running sort of these experiments, but they're really, really bad at um, uh, building up the entire system. So um, Annabel Gao and, and, and Andrew Shipilov have, called, have compared this to a frog that's sort of continuously trying to get in more air and more air to become impressive until the frog explodes. Um, and very often, you know, sort of this, this um, taking on too much resource and power for small organizations has turned out to be difficult. The large firms are much better at sort of these coordinated functions because they have other resources, they can leverage structures and so on and so forth. They very often fail with internal acceptance. Now they actually get an ecosystem going and they get shut down by their own people. Uh, and then finally, um, with respect to a question of planning, and this connects a little bit to, um, to Chris's talk. Um, it's extremely, uh, what we're basically postulating is that it's impossible to plan an ecosystem. Yeah? It's impossible to do task composition appropriately a priori because you don't know what the right outcome is. You cannot know what the right tasks are. You can specify process elements, yeah? but not assign tasks to the right people. Uh, so it brings back a notion of, of design that's much less Simonian and it's much more like Riddle which means that the actual process and the generation of, 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 of preferences is political and collective. It's not technologically determined. And the issue, of course, there is preferences are unknown or potentially unknowable. So if you go back to the, it's not a debate, yeah, but, but some of March's comments about the differences in uncertainty on, on, on preferences and on technologies would come back here as well. So um, yeah, with that, I, I hope I was able to sort of bring us uh, also a little bit um, um, uh, to some questions about coordination. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. We were planning for five, but we have a couple of minutes left. If you have a question or a couple of questions, maybe we'll try to take them. I have a question for Oliver, if we have time. Yeah, please. So around the, what do you think will be kind of based on what you've done, the ecosystem innovation we will see today around kind of open source AI that all the big tech companies are saying that they will collaborate. Do you think it will be indeed, it's a big question, only two minutes, but do you think it will be similar to what you've, you've seen and what you talked about with ecosystem or would it be completely different just because it's a different technology or do you expect same patterns? And given, given what I said, my, my answer must be don't know. But if I, <laughs> if I take the pattern that we've seen, yes. if, if we've seen the pattern, if we just take big data as an example, yes. and I'm actually not sure that this is resolved, but but what our results would suggest is, if, for example, if you go to big data and talk to Oracle, what they mean is database. Yeah, if you go to big data and you go to IBM, what they mean is uh, originally they meant Watson and uh, DB2 and some sort of A system or whatever else. Yeah, and um, uh, what we so the question that that's what's going to happen if they fight about it. Yeah, that they will fight for a terminology and a key interpretation and the ecosystem to emerge around that definition. 
Uh, if, if I get big data to mean database, Oracle wins. If I mean big data to mean AI, actually originally we thought IBM would win, right now it means Amazon wins and so on and so forth. What we have seen, this is the second option, is they, is they um, decide on, or organizations decide on splitting the value chain and defining some areas as being a non-competitive grounds. Basically, they split in the market in upstream, downstream. They decide that upstream um, competition is too costly. And we've seen this actually with IBM's investments in open source. We actually see this in pharma uh, um, quite, quite frequently. Um, that that organization would actually exchange drug candidates. AstraZeneca has done that with, I think, Sanofi. Uh, um, and there's alliances of, of pharma firms and universities and so forth, where they basically jointly do pre-competitive R&D. Yeah? And, and that is the second option, uh, that they decide that this is, in essence, pre-competitive um, or non-competitive, but we have some sort of complements uh, on which we continue to compete. Yeah? And, and the most markets that we've studied, I, I cannot give a number, but sort of by, by just by gut feel, one of the two would happen. Yeah, you, you either fight for the framing or you agree on uh, this is a non-competitive area and you continue to compete as, as before. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's not entirely, or we haven't done work and, and I'm not aware of any work that has mm -hmm. sort of looked into when is it the one, when is it the other and who decides. Okay, fascinating, thank you. Thank you, uh, we've gone over. So thank you to all of you for listening and thank you to Chris Kayla and uh, Oliver for presenting their views. Thank and you with that, for I... inviting us. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Darwin. And thanks, everyone. <laughs>